Hey everyone, welcome back to another session. Today we have Dr. Heyer, she's a periodontist and this is our first session with one, so lots of new information. Um, and we're really excited. Thank you so much for joining us and whenever you're ready, you can start. All right, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Glad to be the first periodontist to convert everyone to be want to be a periodontist too. Um, so my name is Jenna Heyer. I'm a periodontist. I live in Denver, Colorado. Um, just want to share kind of my journey and hopefully give some helpful tips for any of you thinking about heading the same direction. So just kind of a general outline, you know, we'll start off talking a little bit about me, kind of my journey, um, how I chose dentistry and then periodontics afterwards. Uh, we'll go a little bit about what is periodontics and some of the surgeries that I get to do. And then we'll end with just some words of advice and hopefully you have some good questions for me. Please feel free to ask as many as you like. So just starting out, um, I grew up in Whitefish, Montana and I went to undergrad in Montana State University. So nothing super fancy, but um, had a scholarship there and I ended up getting a Bachelor of Science in Cell Biology and Neuroscience. Um, at that point, I was just kind of heading into any pre-med or pre-health kind of thing. I wasn't really set on dentistry at all until kind of near the end of college. So just trying to keep my options open. I ended up doing some research in a genetics lab, mostly because I liked the teacher and just thought it was kind of interesting. Um, but I definitely learned that, you know, a lab is not the place for me. So that was definitely a good experience just to rule that out too. Um, one thing kind of interesting, I mean, it may be unusual or unique. I took a year off in between undergrad and, and dental school. And I did this intentionally because I knew I just wanted to grow a little bit outside of school. I'd been in school my entire life. So I, you know, I can't recommend this enough. I took, I actually graduated a little bit early. So after December of my senior year, I studied for the DAT, the, you know, started my applications and then I went on as many trips as I could in between all the interviews, went to Southeast Asia, went to Europe, went all over the United States. Um, I worked in a restaurant and also part-time as a dental assistant, which was also a really great experience. Um, luckily for me in Montana, I didn't have to do any training. I could just do training on the job. So definitely getting into that dental environment was handy. I still had a lot to learn once I was in school, but it gave me a little preview into what I was getting myself into. Um, so I applied, I think, to seven schools, interviewed at four or so. And I think I, by the end, I was accepted to two because I accepted and kind of declined all the rest. Um, and I just, I loved Colorado, loved the mountains. So I ended up coming to University of Colorado School of Dental Medicine. And I attended there uh, between 2013 and 2017. Um, got to do a lot of cool stuff in dental school. You know, I kind of thought my life would be over going in, but I actually was able to travel during my breaks, did a, some research in global health and also went to Guatemala. So that's that picture of all those cute little kids um, doing a kind of global dentistry. Um, I was involved with ASDA. I was the pre-dental chair. So as you can see, I still have a passion for mentoring pre-dental students. Um, that was really fun, just getting some hands-on events and just mentoring people. And now some of them are already graduated and working as dentists, which, you know, makes me feel a little bit old, but also proud. Um, and then I became the president of a club called Perio After Dark. And it was really just to, you know, we'd have guest speakers. Yes, periodontists come and share cases and try to get people kind of jazzed about perio. We don't just do scaling and root planing or deep cleanings. We do a lot of other stuff too. <clears throat> so dental school again is, you know, I kind of thought my life would be just a slave to school for the rest of those four years, but we were able to have a lot of fun as well. Met a lot of amazing people. Um, that guy in the picture there is now my fiance. <laughs> he was in my class. So you know, just friendships that grow and still keep in touch with so many of my dental school friends. And part of the reason I moved back to Colorado is because a lot of them are still here. Um, but, you know, dental school also requires a lot of work. So a lot of lab projects, as you can see the lower left, 
Um, this simulation clinic is where we spend a lot of our time drilling on plastic teeth, <laughs> um, studying for anatomy, just lots of lectures and classes, and then you know, finally graduation. So um, I'll kind of get into why I chose perio, but I did apply during my, I guess it was my mid to end of junior year in dental school. Um, I applied to about five perio residencies, just based on you know ones that had been recommended to me. UT Health was one of the most highly recommended programs in the country. So I never thought I'd get in, but I did. And so as soon as I got in, I knew I had to had to pick up and move to San Antonio. So I just recently graduated uh, last May. It was kind of a COVID graduation, as I'm sure some of you have experienced. So a little bit different ending than I expected, but you know, just amazing training. I'll spend a good amount of time talking about my residency, just so we can kind of give you an idea more about perio versus general dentistry. <clears throat> So my current situation is I'm working in a private group practice and I'm back in Aurora, Colorado, which is really not far from where I went to dental school. It was, you know, kind of one connection I had a friend from dental school is one of the partners now in this practice. So that's how I kind of got the connection there. So right now I'm an associate and the plan is, you know, for me to buy in as an equal partner. So there'll be four of us total after about a year and a half to two years. And, you know, some of the pros of joining a private practice that's already established is, you know, they've already got everything up and running, the office is established, they have staff, they have protocols, they have instruments, um, you get some inherited referrals, and also a little bit of financial security just because they are, you know, very well established that it's a little bit less scary than starting out on your own. Um, some of the cons I would say are just difficulty implementing changes. We've got a lot of cooks in the kitchen, lots of different ideas and opinions. Um, it's sometimes hard to, you know, you can't do everything the way you would do it if you were the sole owner. So, you know, there's definitely a give and take and happy to answer any questions about that. Um, but for now, it seems to be going pretty, pretty well. So this is a normal day for me right now. Um, I'm seeing patients. Right now I see patients three days a week, but I do work four days a week, um, sometimes five. Uh, do a lot of new patient exams, surgery, post-op visits. And a big part of this last year has been, you know, lots of visiting, referring doctors, trying to make those connections, going to lunch whenever, you know, people can in COVID. Um, so a lot of, a lot, a lot of networking and also study clubs, trying to, again, meet people through that and just continually be learning. So a couple of things, you know, about deciding factors in my job. When I was looking for a job, I was kind of narrowed it down to just based on location. Um, my practice was actively looking for a new doctor versus, you know, sometimes you approach other offices. Um, but I find if they're not actively ready or looking for a doctor, it's probably not the right time to try to be hired by one of them. And again, like I mentioned earlier, a close friend is one of the partners. Um, a couple of things I looked, you know, to look out for when applying for jobs, I think like really trust your gut feeling, don't settle on anything just to have a job. And this goes for dental school too. Um, you know, we're so ready just to get in anywhere that we'll, we'll do anything and go anywhere, but, you know, trust your gut and make sure it's a good fit for you. And then just make sure to consider all options as scary as they are. Um, those be opening your own practice, being an associate or joining a group practice. So just try to keep up, you know, your mind open to things. So um, back to kind of the beginning, I guess, you know, what got me into dentistry in the first place. Um, it, First of all, I'm very interested in hands-on work and I love art. I love to paint and make jewelry. I actually always thought I'd be an orthodontist because I used to bend wires and make earrings and stuff, but I kind of went the total opposite way. Um, the ability to be a business owner is pretty big in dentistry. A lot of that freedom is really kind of gone in the medical world. Um, and I also really would prefer working in a clinic versus a hospital. So that's a big part of just your everyday life. 
Um, also dentistry gives us a lot of work-life balance. You know, not a lot of us are working through the nights or anything like that. So we can work kind of fewer days and just be able to live a pretty, pretty nice life. Um, the way I chose dentistry was I spent a few months after, after the semester ended my junior year in college and just try to shadow as many places as I could. I went to a vet office, I went to a medical office, just all kinds of places and just really tried to feel like what felt right to me. Um, and for me, it was seeing an oral surgeon and seeing the surgery and extractions. And that was when I left and just felt like really jazzed and, and really inspired. So that was kind of my turning point moment. It was just, I met again, an amazing oral surgeon. She was this really cool lady and she was a really good mentor too. So then, you know, obviously I went to dental school. Um, I always loved surgery. I always loved anatomy lab and like dissecting things, which is kind of gross sounding, but, um, I just always really loved taking teeth out more than I loved doing a filling. So, um, wasn't as passionate about the restorative dentistry that, you know, general dentistry encompassed. And I really liked the idea of kind of combining oral health with comprehensive health with periodontics is really a big, big part of it. And Lastly, I just really like the idea of being able to do sedation. It's kind of part of our training and part of something I do pretty routinely. So what is periodontics? Um, I'm sure everyone listening is probably from a variety of backgrounds, so this may be very obvious, but just for anyone who's not aware, um, it's a specialty focusing on everything around the teeth. So the bone, the gingiva, those little ligament connecting the tooth to the bone. And literally it means around teeth. So pretty much that's how I explain every type of specialty. Endodontics means within or inside the tooth, you know, et cetera. So, you know, that's how we kind of differentiate what part of the mouth we're looking at. Um, it does require a three-year residency program. As far as I know, there are no shorter or longer programs, um, unless you're doing a combination like perio -pros type of thing. So the procedures that we do, it's honestly very, very, you know, it varies a lot. Um, you know, I thought going into a specialty, I'd get really good at one certain thing, but in reality, we do a ton of different things. Uh, we treat gum disease, which is kind of our bread and butter, you know, just treating periodontal disease. We do a lot of dental implants, bone grafts, gum grafts, sinus lifting, extracting teeth. Uh, we diagnose or, and biopsy oral lesions and then IV sedation as well. And there definitely are more things than that. So just a couple cases, um, you know, periodontitis is inflammation around the teeth resulting in loss of bone and tissue attachment. So the top picture is kind of a healthy mouth and the bottom picture is the periodontitis mouth. Um, obviously you need x-rays and a clinical exam to really diagnose it, but you can kind of get the idea just uh, what that tissue attachment can look like. Um, and it can be related to a lot of, definitely related to smoking, uncontrolled diabetes, and some other health issues. Um, family history is a factor, and then poor oral hygiene and poor dental care. So periodontal surgery, the goal is to re reduce the pocket between the gum and the tooth, uh, clean the root surfaces. You can see the difference between the top and bottom. The bone has been smoothed out because the gums will kind of follow the bone. The bone sets the tone is kind of the, the little phrase that you hear a lot. Um, so wherever the architecture of the bone is, is kind of where the gums will heal. And we want to allow these teeth to be accessible for cleaning, not only by the patient, but also by hygienists so they can be maintained in the long term and prevent any inflammation from further bone loss. We also do a lot of dental implants. This is probably one of my favorite things to do. Um, we can do a wide variety. Sometimes it's single tooth, multiple teeth, full arches for you know, retaining dentures or a hybrid type of denture. Um, sometimes we take the tooth out, put the implant in the same time. So an immediate implant. Um, and I just think it's a really great option for patients to replace missing teeth. I think we're all probably familiar with these. 
Um, and I, you know, as a specialist, we tend to get the cases that are not so straightforward. Um, there are a lot of general dentists placing implants these days, but not a lot of general dentists are doing big ridge augmentations of the bone or big sinus lifts. So generally those are the ones that, you know, we see the most. So this is a case where the patient had been missing two teeth for many, many years and the bone kind of atrophied away. So we had to rebuild it. In this case, I used some tenting screws and you can kind of see where the head of the screw is where we've grown bone to, but there's kind of a more where that part is sticking out. That's kind of where we started. So growing the bone kind of horizontally and then going back later, we did a guided implant placement. Um, I also do a lot of sinus lifts, which is also a really cool surgery if you've ever seen one. Um, just you know, lateral window, access to the maxillary sinus, lifting up that schneideri membrane, placing bone graft below. Sometimes we can place the implant if it's stable and then placing more bone on top of that. And I do have a video, hopefully it'll work. You can kind of see with each breath um, that membrane lifting. So it's not a surprise to me that we have to overhear the bone coronally. And that's what maybe the physical is going to have to be coronal bone loss. Deep breath in. Um, in your nose. And now, there you go. So those are always kind of fun. But you know, you don't have a perforation when it'll, when it will do that. So that's always a good sign. Um, we do a lot of gum grafting. That's probably one of the main things I do as a periodontist, especially in Denver, where a lot of people are placing their own implants. So in this case, you know, we're treating some root you know, gum recession, trying to cover up the roots. So we create a little tunnel um, between the gingiva and the bone, and then we place a connective tissue graft that we harvest from the palate and suture it all a little bit coronally to cover up that recession. And I have a video too here. This, so this is the connective tissue graft. This is the gingiva. And you'll see just kind of how you tunnel and pull it through that tunnel. I always think videos are a little bit more helpful than photos. So. Um, one of my favorite, other favorite things, I guess it sounds like I have a lot of favorites, but good thing I became a periodontist, um, something called aesthetic crown lengthening. So patients who have kind of short square teeth and kind of a gummy smile, we can treat a lot of times with something called aesthetic crown lengthening. So we remove some excess tissue and also some extra bone to lengthen those, those teeth. And, you know, a lot of cases like this are just, you know, instantaneously, life-changing for the patient. It's really fun to give them a mirror at the end of the procedure and really can be life-changing for a lot of people. So this is one of the more fun ones just because a lot of the things I do don't really show like instant uh, gratification. So this is a really fun one to do. Um, another thing, lastly, we're always, you know, really, I'm always doing a really thorough exam looking for any unusual lesions. Also, I get referred these lesions sometimes for biopsying. So generally I'll start with a biopsy and depending on the results, you know, that we kind of go from there, but it is kind of interesting. Some of the things we can identify in the mouth, we can, some cases with severe gum disease, we find that the patient has uncontrolled diabetes or undiagnosed diabetes. Um, certain lesions can show up in the mouth that are indicative of Crohn's disease, uh, leukemia, or even metastasis of cancer. Uh, luckily, I haven't found too many terrible things yet in my career, but, you know, I'm sure it's bound to happen and it can be a good or bad thing to be that person, but definitely it's good when you can help someone diagnose something else that's going on in their body. So sedation is something I am very passionate about doing. I think it makes the experience so much better for patients when they just can be relaxed and you know, in a twilight zone kind of level, it's not deep sedation. So patients are still breathing on their own and they will respond purposefully to me if I, you know, ask them a question or stimulate them somehow. Um, you know, we have to be trained really pretty, very well in emergency medicine, how to deal with 
any kind of adverse drug reactions or allergic reactions. So we actually take ACLS, which is the same training course that a lot of nurses and even physicians take kind of just on a every other year basis. Um, but this is definitely a fun part of, you know, my residency was very, very strong in this. So we did, I think I did over 200 cases in my three years, which is pretty unusual. If you start talking to other uh, residencies, it's usually around 20 to 30 is, I mean, 20 is the minimum to get your license. So definitely I feel very comfortable doing sedation and I've kind of implemented that into my practice here. <clears throat> so just, you know, I want to kind of explain a little bit about what residency is like. Um, for us, it was about 35 months minus COVID. We ended a little bit shorter, um, but we have a lot of didactic time, a little bit more than I anticipated my first year. Um, clinical time varies, kind of increases each year. So we start around two days a week and we ended about three and a half, sometimes four days a week. Uh, we do a master's research thesis, and then we have weekly literature review. So we have 38 weeks where we would cover anywhere between 20 and 40, maybe 50 articles um, based on a specific topic in periodontics. For example, we spent four weeks just talking about implants. So we definitely get a really good background and of every aspect of, you know, to the microscopic scale, to the more macroscopic scale, but lots of reading and lots of, uh, lots of studying. So here's, you know, kind of the reality of what my studying would look like a lot of days, just lots of papers, lots of, you know, we all have our different ways of studying, but we take quite a bit of oral pathology. So three years of, you know, even by the end last year, we were one-on-one -on -one with a uh, oral pathologist. Uh, I guess not one-on-one, -on -one. it was five, five of us and one of them, but you know, really nice to have a smaller class size and really work in depth with oral pathologists and radiologists. And we learn a lot about research methodologies, practice management. We take courses just on perio topics. So really a good variety in our, at least in my residency, we, we covered a lot of different material. And then exams, um, we had quite a few written exams our first year. Um, by the time our second and third year, we mostly just had our oral exams twice a year. We had mock board exam once a year and then case presentations, we had one big one once a year. So the reality of the clinical part of residency is you're kind of, your, you know, you're like a one man show. <laughs> you're calling and scheduling your patients. You're managing all your patient pools. If you know you call someone three times, they don't answer, you have to discontinue them and write a note in their chart and blah, blah, blah. It's kind of a lot of, a lot of that type of stuff. Um, but then you're doing exams, you're reviewing, putting together your own treatment plans and reviewing them. You're signing, having your patients you know, review and sign consent forms. And then you know, we had to scan everything in ourselves. So get pretty quick at that. Um, of course, we're doing surgery, and then a lot of times we're cleaning up, setting up our own operatory for each patient. So you really are kind of your own front desk, your own assistant, your own practice manager, and you really, you know, the experience you get is what you make it. So, of course, there are patients, you know, sent to us directly, but you kind of have to hustle on your own to really get you know, as much out of the time as you can. So, just like private practice, you got to meet dental students in this case, or dentists, um, make friends with the other residencies and try to get some good connections to get you some really great experience. Um, the next thing about residency was, you know, not every residency requires a research project or a master's thesis, but mine did. Uh, we were presented with projects, so they had them kind of already put together. Some of them had kind of carried on throughout you know, several years. Um, and they're kind of all a little bit different. Some were more lab, some were more clinical, some were, you know, there were a couple more biology, you know, lab type of things. Um, and we were required to write, edit, and publish our journal in a periodontics journal. And something exciting, at least for me, is that mine was finally published in the March 
last month issue of the Journal of Periodontology. So if anyone wants some light reading, uh, this is it. <laughs> um, so I did research on detecting dental calculus using digital radiography. Um, check it out if you're interested, but it was probably one of the biggest projects of my residency. So it's really nice to see that finally, <laughs> finally in print. So this is just a little bit more about kind of what my research looked like. This is me presenting at a, a research competition and we also have to present a master's thesis defense. Um, so you really work hard for those extra two letters so that master of science. Um, back to work-life balance. So again, you know, kind of going in, I thought, oh man, I'm never gonna have fun again going into residency, but turned out I was able to travel quite a bit more than I thought. Um, then I really took advantage of having those one to two week breaks, went to Europe, went to Iceland, went to Germany or Europe, um, just really took advantage of the time. And I'm really glad I did because, you know, now that I'm working, it's definitely harder to really get away for more than a week at a time. So it's life isn't over. It still can be fun. And, you know, you make really great friends just like dental school. Um, we also, you know, I think it's important to keep up your hobbies. I think for me, I still would paint. Exercising was really big. We ended up having almost our entire residency going to Orange Theory at one point. Um, being outside, spending time with family and friends. And, you know, it's really important to give yourself a break at any point in your career. But, you know, definitely when you're juggling like 12 different things at once. So just a couple, you know, tips, I guess, to how to prepare if you're an undergrad. I think research is always helpful. I don't think it's a make or break it kind of thing. I just did it because I enjoyed it. And then at the end, I didn't really enjoy it that much, but um, I wouldn't force yourself to do it, but it's, it's just something to add to your, your repertoire. And it does help, especially for me going into then having to do a master's thesis, um, join a pre-dental group get a really good support system. It's so much more helpful if you're not trying to navigate all these steps on your own. Um, keep your grades up. That really keeps your options open. And also try to be involved in extracurriculars. I think that's my biggest piece of advice. After doing all the pre-dental um, mentoring and dental school, I kind of talked to a lot of the faculty who were all on the admissions, um, admissions board. They're always interviewing people and kind of would tell me terrible things people would do or great things people would do or say. And um, just really anything unique to set you apart is I think the biggest thing that stands out. So whether it's, you know, making jewelry or, you know, hiking 14,000 foot mountains, like whatever it is, just something to set yourself apart. Um, job shadowing, I think is really important just because None of us really know the reality of a job until you really see it for yourself. So I know it's kind of hard right now, but it should be getting easier. And I really think a lot of people are probably fine with you going into shadow as long as it's just a small setting. Um, and talk to as many people in the field as you can. And again, just try to get a real reality of the day-to-day -day life. Um, it's really easy to see someone who's, you know, kind of at the end of their career and just everything seems pretty easy for them, but you have to also see people who are maybe just starting out or just getting out of school because, you know, it's not always as easy as it may look, but just, you know, if you can see people in every stage, I think that's really helpful. So if you're in dental school and you're hoping to go to perio residency, um, if you have a perio residency at your school, definitely get to know the residents, the faculty, don't be shy. I mean, don't be annoying, but I think the more you just kind of be like a real person and be their friend, um, I think that really helped me too, just making connections to getting into residency. Um, again, extracurriculars, just do something unique. I mean, for me, it was probably the global health thing, which had absolutely nothing to do with periodontics, it actually had more to do with pediatric dentistry. Um, but it was something I was really passionate about, and I definitely hope to continue just as my love of traveling. And then just make sure you're applying to residency for the right reasons. Um, it's definitely not a, like, something to do to like get rich fast or something, because that's definitely not the case. 
Um, don't do it just for the prestige or if that's even a thing, but you know, just really make sure that you actually are really passionate about what you're going into because without that passion, residency and real practice will be terrible. Um, I think I've said this like 10 times, but try to meet people as much as possible. Um, for me, it was kind of like for each step of the way, there was one pivotal person or maybe two or three of them. But, you know, that's, again, how I got into Perio was just making a friend with one of the Perio residents and seeing what they did and kind of being encouraged to apply. So um, keep your hobbies and keep your life outside of dentistry. Um, you really have to have other things that you enjoy doing. And, you know, it really is worth all the hard work. Um, I wouldn't say there's just like an end, end point where all of a sudden, okay, I'm done. It's, I'm still constantly learning, constantly trying to get better at surgery, still have a lot to learn, even though I've gone through all this school. Um, it's still, you know, there's always something, something that's next. So you have to kind of be ready to really keep it up and keep pushing yourself through all the, the hard parts. And a couple of things I wish I would have known when I was applying, um, you know, you don't really realize how much of dentistry is customer service. So a lot of it's just not that I do things just to make people happy, but, you know, a lot of people's emotions and response to you and their reactions can really take a toll on you or they can make your day, you know, a great patient makes my day awesome, but then a, a grumpy upset patient can really ruin it. So that's kind of a, a big part. You know, you're constantly working with people. Um, dentistry is also pretty hard on your body, especially periodontics. It's kind of hard to have really great posture and use your mirror the way you should as a general dentist, but you know, necks and backs are constantly having issues. Um, and then being a specialist does involve a lot of time building relationships with potential referrals. You know, I've been working now for nine months and I still spent today went going to six different offices and going to lunch with the dentist. And it's just a lot of, a lot of driving, a lot of go, 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 meet and greet. You kind of have to learn to not take things personally when people don't want to meet you. So it's kind of like dating, but for referrals, I guess. And that's all I have. Um, we can go through some questions. Also, please, if you'd like to see some more bloody surgeries, follow me on my Instagram, it's Hire Perio. Um, I did start a blog. It's kind of still a work in progress, but I'm trying to put a couple pre-dental little tidbits on there. Um, and then feel free to email me. But I think generally Instagram is a good way to communicate with me. Um, feel free to message me if you have any specific questions. But I would love to hear you guys have anything for me awesome um thank you so much for that amazing presentation um we definitely have some questions from our instagram and our youtube so um i can just ask them now um so the first kind of questions we have is just regarding private practice you had mentioned that you were going to buy into um a practice but just in general like with managing and just opening a private practice what are kind of some things to know about that and just best ways to learn yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm still learning a ton. Um, I think what every single person who owns a dental office will tell you is that the worst part is just staff issues and hiring and firing. And, you know, unfortunately, there's generally a lot of turnover and in, in your front desk or your assistants, just, it's just the way it is. So you just have to really roll with the punches. And it's a lot of people management, <laughs> which is hard. I guess at this point, you know, I'm not really in charge of a lot of that type of thing because I'm not an owner of my practice, but, you know, definitely is a lot to, a lot to take on. And it's kind of part of the reason I didn't want to open my own practice right away um, or maybe ever, who knows, but it is nice to share some of that responsibility versus, you know, at the end of the day, you're the boss. You, if it's just you, you have to make a lot of a lot of decisions, lots of hard calls. Um, learning, I think, I know there's lots of books out there, but I think a lot of people just kind of learn as they go. So you just have to kind of jump in and talk to friends, see what they're doing, or they have this issue, this and that. 
So just have to kind of fake it till you make it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, so now like taking a step back to kind of dental school and like when you did apply, like what were some factors that you looked at specifically when choosing um, your dental school? And then what made you choose this one? Like what was like one of the best things about the dental school you went to? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I definitely was naive, you know, but when I started school and looked back, I, there's a lot of things maybe I would have looked into more. Um, I think one thing that's important is knowing, I mean, I think the most important thing is talking to current students and seeing if they're happy, what they like, what they dislike. Um, I went on one or two interviews and the, I had a host and they just seemed to hate their school. So that definitely did not motivate me to want to go there. Um, when I interviewed in Colorado, just like everyone seemed to love the, the school. They had only great things to say. Um, also for me at the time, I just, I kind of based it on where did I want to live, which maybe is the best thing to, to dictate, but I wanted to be close, you know, that I could be an easy flight from, from home or see kind of centralized and Denver for me is, I mean, that's why I still love living here. It's so easy to get anywhere from here. And I love to travel too. So, um, and another really important thing is like, how soon are you actually going to see a patient? Because some schools, you don't see a patient until maybe end of your second year. And Colorado, we start really like in the middle of our first year, just starting to get in there and assisting and you kind of get hands-on pretty, pretty fast. Um, the last thing is we have a program called ACTS at Colorado and you get to go work in other practices. I think it's one, two weeks at a time. So you get some really great experience outside of school. You know, at school, you see one patient in the morning, one patient in the afternoon well, on these ACTS rotations and they're kind of hit or miss, but I was lucky to get some good ones and you see just like a normal dentist schedule. So that really prepares you for the real world. I got a lot of really good clinical experience and, you know, going to residency, you see, you can compare, you know, where your co-residents went to school versus where you went to school. And I felt extremely prepared compared to a couple of them, but, um, and just in general, like I felt like I had a really good clinical experience. Awesome, thank you. Um, so next question has to um, do with like patient interactions. Obviously, that's a huge part of dentistry in general. But when you do have a patient that might not be cooperative or just not um, in the best of moods, how do you kind of deal with that? Um, yeah, it's really hard because you kind of you kind of always have to try to be positive and put a smile on your face and try to be as you know keep your cool. You never want to freak out at a patient. Um, I'd say it's pretty minimal, like the number of times that I've really been pushed to being upset at a patient. <laughs> there are times where I just have to get up and walk around, take a, take a break, take a deep breath. Um, cause some people are just really hard to, you know, they just, they can just really make your life not great. Um, not intentionally for some, but some are just not great. So, I mean, worst case scenario, you always have the right as a dentist to tell you know, you have to refer them or give them an option to go somewhere else. Um, you have to tell them that you'll take care of them for the next 30 days or however long, but you do have the right to dismiss a patient if it really gets to that point. And I haven't really ever had to do that, but you know, that is something that, you know, is, is there for a reason. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the next question, actually, this is like a really interesting point that you mentioned just about like the back and neck pain. And I can imagine just like from dental school to residency to not practicing, like it probably is a lot like on like the neck and the back. So how do you like combat like that and prevent it to be bad? Yeah, I mean, I hope I'm preventing it. I'm still pretty young in my career. But um, I mean, for me, like fitness is really important and trying to strengthen my back and my core just because that's when, you know, if you don't have a strong core, like everything mm -hmm. just goes downhill from there. Mm -hmm. um, yoga and stretching and like rolling out your back on a foam roller, it's pretty big. And, you know, it's not that common that I have like pain, I guess, but there are times after a long surgery or a difficult tooth extraction that, you know, your back is kind of sore for a few days. So it's, you just have to kind of mentally 
reset your body and try to get into a better position. Um, and I really hope that I don't have any issues in the long run, but I know a lot of dentists who've had like neck surgery, fusions, a lot of them who can't practice anymore. And that's why they're working at a dental school. Um, but I think in dental school nowadays, like they're making a much bigger effort to teach you proper ergonomics than they did in the past. So, but like I said, in perio, it's sometimes impossible to have perfect posture. So you're kind of doing a lot of this, <laughs> but luckily we get faster with time. So you're doing it for less amount of time. Residency is the time where you're doing surgery for three hours and that's probably the worst. Awesome. Uh, thank you. So the next question kind of has to do with, obviously like even through the videos, we saw that it's very surgical and like invasive. Um, so in what cases or like, would you refer out to an oral surgeon or what kind of things would an oral surgeon do that a periodontist won't do or vice versa, if that makes sense? Yeah, that's a good question. And honestly, there's a lot of crossover, you know, and it, some periodontist kind of practice as an oral surgeon, you know, they do wisdom teeth, they do bigger surgeries. Uh, the biggest difference I always tell people is I don't do like gunshot wound type things. <laughs> like I'm not in the hospital suturing up someone's, you know, face or I don't do any extra oral stuff really. Um, there's, there are times that I will prefer to have, you know, I guess there's not many times I've had to refer to an oral surgeon. Um, but there are some limitations, I guess, of what I feel comfortable doing. Um, but there's a lot of things that we both do and it definitely gets confusing for, for people. And like, there's some oral surgeons who do great gum grafting, but I'd say the majority don't do a lot of gum grafts. Um, not a lot of periodontists really do wisdom teeth, but again, some do. So I'm kind of not doing a lot of wisdom teeth. So that is one thing I refer. If it looks like a hard one, I'll do that. I'll send it to them. <laughs> <laughs> nice to have that one more layer that I can still refer to. True, true. Um, awesome. So the next question I was gonna ask you is what's your favorite like procedure to do? And can you like kind of walk us through like verbally kind of what prep you would have to do, kind of the tools you would need and kind of just the setup in general, if you can? Yeah. Well, that's okay. a hard question though. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um well, I'll give you the example of like a dental implant. So <laughs> I had a patient come in last week. She broke off number nine, which is like right in the front. She fell on ice and that's like everyone's worst nightmare. Um, but she fractured the tooth right off and something I've been doing a lot more. I didn't really show an example, but doing a lot more guided implant surgery. So take an impression of the teeth. I send it to my lab because right now I don't have my own scanner. Um, hopefully eventually I will. Um, and then we plan the implant placement together. We plan the guide. We plan a temporary tooth to screw in. Um, that way, by the time the surgery comes along, you know, everything's kind of planned in advance. So get the patient numb. If we're doing sedation, get them sedated. Um, take the tooth out, put that guide in, drill for your implant, put the implant in and put a you know, bone graft around the implant and if we have a temporary tooth, we can screw that in or a temporary healing abutment just to get the tissue to start shaping and then kind of suture everything closed. So, I mean, it's a lot of materials, implant motor, you gotta get that all set up, um, bone graft material. We also, I do a lot of PRF. So I, I draw some of their blood. Um, I do that before I start. So we draw some blood, we spin it in our centrifuge and we get, for three minutes, we get the top layer, we mix that with a bone graft and it just makes something called sticky bone. So it's kind of almost like Rice Krispies that are soft, you know, they kind of sticks together. Um, and then we pack that around the implant, put a little membrane, cover that up, suture everything closed. So that's one of my favorite things. Gum grafts, my other favorite thing. And one of the things I do that I'm always like amazed that we can do that. <laughs> um, so I don't know, I guess I could talk about that for a while, but I'll stop there. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you. Um, so the next question kind of has to do with uh, the transition from like undergrad to dental school and then dental school to residency. So like within all those transitions, which was like probably the hardest for you to like kind of get used to and which was like not as hard, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if like one was harder than the other. I think when I started dental school, I'd been out of school for a year and a half. So I kind of had to kick back into, you know, studying. And honestly, by the time I, between the time I went to college and then started dental school, everything went to like laptops, which you guys are all too young probably to think about that. But in college, I'd never had a laptop. I'd never brought my laptop to class, but then all of a sudden dental school, everything was all digital stuff. And so that was kind of a weird transition. Um, and then from dental school to residency, my last year of dental school, after boards were over, we were kind of winding down, had a lot of free time, done all of our requirements. And then all of a sudden residency just, you know, it's, it's like dental school, but on steroids even. I thought I'd done a lot and then I went to residency and it was it's like every time the bar just keeps getting raised. So you just kind of find out that you actually can do a lot. Um, and you can push yourself really hard. Awesome. Um, so the next question kind of has to do with study habits and how those change, um, like how you think you study different, like in dental school and like undergrad and residency. Yeah. So dental, when I say, when I compare dental school to college, college seemed so easy <laughs> looking back because, you know, we'd have one lecture in dental school and it would cover the material that we probably did in almost the whole semester in a dental in a class in undergrad you know like for example physiology you've got one two-hour lecture on everything of like the endocrine system or something and so that was just like an overwhelming amount of material to get used to um they say it's like drinking out of a fire a fire hose because you're just blasted with so much information so in dental school what i did i think by the end of my first year, I ended up getting with my now best friend and another girl in our class. And we kind of took turns making study guides out of the, out of the lectures because all of us just weren't really big fans of studying on PowerPoint. So we just kind of took the PowerPoint, took our notes, condensed into a study guide. And by the end of dental school, we had like 15 people in this group and it got a little out of hand, but I mean, it was it was pretty popular. And I think our study guides are probably still being used. I don't really know, but so that was how we really got through dental school. We would get together in that group of two or three of us and just talk through our study guides because, you know, dental school, you just get so fatigued. You're in clinic all day. You're not versus undergrad. You're like in class four hours a day or something, but in dental school, you're basically working like eight to five and then you have to study. So that really helped. Um, you know, help us all just to stay motivated, stay awake, <laughs> just to talk through it, get together. And, you know, we'd usually review it alone first and then review it together. And I think that was a big difference from undergrad was studying that way. Um, in residency, you kind of took it even a step further where, you know, we, we had oral exams and that was something completely new to me. I've never had to take an oral exam before. And that's because our board exam is an oral exam. So versus being able to identify like a multiple choice answer, you have to just on the top of your head, be able to spiel out something about, tell me about periodontal disease, something very vague, but you have to have a specific answer or it can be very specific. Like tell me about Crohn's disease and periodontitis or, you know, then you have to cite literature. You have to kind of create stories. So I typed out all these stories and my co-resident and I would just study out loud all the time just like ask each other questions and we'll probably still do that for our board exam that's coming up in August so that's how we studied in residency oh I didn't know you have to still take exams I thought you were yeah <laughs> it never ends guys oh my okay well good luck with that. <laughs> um, last one see. hopefully okay no, I mean, um, it's last exam, not question, but. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no worries, I gotcha. Okay, let's see. So the next question has to do with, like, um, dental emergencies in the office, especially since this is very, like, invasive, and, like, God forbid, if something did, like, ever happen, like, what are, like, the protocols with that, and, like, who can you call if you ever need help, and just, like, regarding that? Yeah, so in my residency, we did a simulation. We had a really awesome teacher, um, who would, you know, we'd go 
first of all, we take an eight week long sedation course. And a lot of that is also emergencies. Um, but then throughout the rest of the three years, just to keep everything up, uh, we went and did these, we call it Sim Man. He was just this little robot, robotic man who, you know, could simulate all these emergencies. So guy's name is Dr. Luz. So if he ever sees that, um, he's awesome. So that's how we would kind of continually learn how to actually do it in real life. You know, okay, my patient's have, you know, diagnosing a heart attack, diagnosing a stroke, what do you do next? This and that. Um, a lot of times, you know, the most common emergencies in a dental setting is either fainting or a seizure. I mean, the heart attack stroke can happen. That's not something we usually cause, but it's just kind of random that can happen. Um, or other terrible things like cardiac arrest, et cetera. So, I mean, the first thing is knowing like when to call 911, which is for a lot of those like immediately. Um, and then we spend a week in the VA hospital learning how to intubate patients, um, which is not something I really ever do, but just really learning how to keep a patient's airway, keep them breathing just with the bag, with the intubation, whatever. So, you know, I think we had like amazing training in emergencies. We have, we're, we were quizzed on it for every exam too. Um, and now I just have some little note cards that I've made and I've put it with my emergency kit because, you know, in times of panic, it's easy to forget those things. So just making it as easy as possible for yourself. Um, I just had this like little back and front and back paper and it's just seizure, stroke, etc. cetera. Um, so that's kind of what I do. Just try to make like label every vial of drug that you could ever want to give and write exactly the, the dose on it. So you don't panic in the moment and do something really wrong. But okay. I've had to deal with a couple and you just have to, like the more training you have, the more normal it feels, I guess. It's still scary though. Um, okay, let's see. So the next question kind of has to do with, since you are at an office with other periodontists, correct? Like with mm -hmm. other, yeah, okay. So I was like, just wondering, like, how's the office dynamic? Like, do you guys talk about cases together or does everyone have their own case or like, how does that kind of work? Um, so we all have our own patients and, you know, we kind of work pretty separately. Um, luckily for me, you know, I, I just ask my associates quite a lot of questions and especially one of them, he has to listen to me a lot, but I just, you know, ask like, what would you do here? What, you know, and he's been really, really great about kind of mentoring me. And although maybe some things we don't do the same way, it's just kind of nice to have a second set of eyes on it. And even when a weird thing comes up, um, which I think it was only in one time since I started that I had him come look at a patient with me, but um, it's just nice to see, or just to have someone else there to kind of be your mentor, um, especially right out of school or residency. It's just, uh, definitely nice to not be all on your own, but you still have to kind of you know, know what to do on your own. So, I mean, they're, they're kind of like as involved or uninvolved as I want them to be. They don't, they don't, I don't think they're looking through and seeing what I'm doing really. Um, but if I ask them, they'll definitely be there to help. So that's been really nice. And my co-residents, like they're the best support system. We have a group chat of just, you know, funny little fails that we have <laughs> in the real world. And, you know, it's just kind of comical, honestly, just the things we are going through, but I'm really lucky to have them and have someone to talk to because it's kind of weird finally being out on your own. And, you know, we've always been in school. so that's really been a lifesaver. Thank you. Um, so the next question um, just has to do with uh, uh, like, did you ever consider another specialty other than periodontist or did you just like know right off the bat that this is what you wanted to do once you came to dental school or like later on? Yeah, that's a really good question. And the answer is I probably looked at every single specialty. Um, going into dental school, I really just, thought I'd do general dentistry. I had no plans to keep going. Um, it wasn't until I really didn't even know what periodontics was, to be honest. I had no idea what that was until, I mean, in, the first thing we learn about periodontics is just deep cleanings and probing. And it's pretty boring when you first learn about it. Um, 
So I kind of thought about a couple other things. I thought about prosthodontics. It was kind of just early on in school. Um, but really for me, it was kind of getting into the perio clinic and making friends with the residents and having my friend who was already, a, his brother was a resident and seeing what they did. And that, that just got me really, like I always wanted to be in that clinic. So I kind of had to just trust, you know, my gut there. And um, I'm very glad I did because it definitely ended up being the perfect fit for me, but I did not go into dental school with that expectation. And I think it's good to go into dental school expecting to be a general dentist because otherwise you don't care about any of the stuff you learn about. Like I wouldn't have paid any attention to denture class or, you know, all these other topics. Cause I just would have thought, Oh, I'm never going to do that. But so I think it's good to be ready to be a general dentist, especially if you don't end up going into a specialty. Um, but I think I decided for sure by my third year, which was really cutting it close for the application process. And it worked out for me, but it's kind of slightly unplanned in the beginning. Awesome. Uh, so I think we have time for like one more question. Um, so this just kind of has to do with like dealing with blood. Like obviously this is a very <laughs> invasive um, specialty. So like, were you just always used to like being blood or comfortable? Cause I know like personally I'm not. So like, do you like build up resistance or like <laughs> about that <laughs> um, well funny story when I was shadowing before dental school I was at an office and I was watching this big surgery and I just started feeling terrible and I ended up passing out during the surgery so I think I just combination of like not eating standing hot you know all that stuff and I was like I swear it's not the blood I was so embarrassed <laughs> um but it's happened to a lot of people you know who end up becoming surgeons but for some people, they know that's the moment when they're not supposed to be a surgeon. Um, and like I said, I always loved anatomy. Like I would just like love dissecting cadavers. And I just thought it was so cool to see like real life anatomy. And I think that's one of the biggest, cool, like coolest parts of my job. Um, but I've, I've never really had an issue with blood or like gory things. So, so no, I guess for me, I never had to build that resistance, but I'd say if you have an aversion to blood and you know that about yourself, then perio is probably not for you. <laughs> Maybe ortho or, you know, general dentistry or something. Um, hey, awesome. So I think that's it for today's session. Um, once again, thank you so much for that amazing presentation and the question and answer session. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, definitely let me know if you have any other questions mm -hmm. or message me on Instagram. If if uh, anything else comes up, I'm always happy to help. Of course. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, guys.